Hello, Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Franck's Symphony in D minor. Now, you know, the Franck Symphony used to be standard repertoire. Everybody recorded it. It got played all the time, and now it's practically vanished. You almost never see new recordings, and it's really kind of astonishing how quickly fortunes have changed. Franck's music generally, as I mentioned in talking about his violin sonata, seems to be out of favor. And it's just a tragedy because he was such a great composer who didn't write a tremendous amount of music. I mean, when you think about it, there's the symphonic variations, there's the symphony, there's a handful of symphonic poems, there's a couple pieces of chamber music, and the organ music. And that's what we know. The truth of the matter is there's a ton of other stuff that nobody plays, including early music. You know, there's a whole grand opera called Holda, the dances from which, the ballet music from which was released recently on Naxos. You know, there, there is music there. And some of it is quite beautiful. He wrote a couple of piano concertos. I mean, you know, there is real, a real body of work. And we've only been exposed to the cream of the crop, but it is the cream of the crop. It is great stuff. And this symphony was, of course, one of the handful of great French symphonies from the second half of the 19th century, along with the Sassol III and, you know, maybe a couple of others that you were, you know, the immature Bizet Symphony, which wasn't really discovered till the 1920s, and a couple other pieces. But it was, it was an astonishing achievement for a composer who was toward the end of his career. It was premiered in 1888 and caused a riot, supposedly because the slow movement uses an English horn. God forbid. You know, it was like Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre caused a riot because it used a xylophone. You know, people had way too much time on their hands back then. And the French, of course, really didn't need much of an excuse to riot. That was sort of their national pastime, especially over cultural matters. You know, remember the riot at the Rite of Spring premiere? You know, that's what they do. They go to the concert, then they have a riot. Anyway, the Franck D minor basically has two kinds of performances. There's the sort of more classical one with proportional tempos and a, a, a certain leanness and what you might call classically French crispness and rhythm. And then there is the hyper-romantic, let it all hang out, slush around with the tempos, you know, the kind of thing Leopold Stokowski did with it, but I'm not talking about his version because it's like, it, it's on his, comes from his nutsy department, you know what I mean? But there are great performances of both categories, and I'm not going to make a big pile of CDs and go through them. I'm sure you'll have your favorite. I'm only going to talk about two, because I really find, I find them to be great and to be real exemplars of the approach to performance. The first is this one, Leonard Bernstein with the Orchestre National de France. This is a splendid performance in that ripe romantic tradition where you pull back at the climaxes and you speed up the exciting bits. And it's, it's just terrific. He's got the orchestra really galvanized and it's coupled with a stunning Roussel Symphony Number no. 3 from the same series of concerts. If you can get this particular one without having to buy, you know, an enormous box of Bernstein, it's, it's in there, of course, but you know, the DG thing, which I actually have, it's over there. It's on the, you know, Karyan's over here and Bernstein's over there. And I have them separated by the bookcase so that they don't start an argument like in the middle of the night or something like that. But really it's a great performance of its type, of its type. I mean, spontaneous and passionate and definitely, definitely making a great case for that approach to the music. However, on the other side, the sort of leaner, more classical, more flowing, and and a little bit less self-indulgent approach, we have the classic, it's over here, Monteux with the Chicago Symphony. And we need to give this particular performance a certain amount of consideration because not only is it the greatest performance of the Franck Symphony that has ever been recorded, and that, by the way, really is a general consensus view. I mean, most people would say, if you're gonna have one recording of the Franck Symphony, Monteux is the way to go. I mean, he's to Chicago, is Reiner's Chicago at that period, you know, in the early 60s. I mean, it's just, it's just 
great. But why is it so great? Well, this is historically important as well because it shows definitively that, remember Roger Norrington, the guy who I said his whole career is a fraud? Well, Monta is one of the conductors who proves it. There are others, Bruno Walter is one too, and I've talked about him somewhat as well in my, in my discussion of vibrato and Beethoven. But how do we know that Roger Norrington's whole approach to performance of romantic music, leaving the vibrato out of the strings and all that is nonsense? We know because Pierre Monteux not only knew the Franck D minor, he attended the premiere. He was 13 years old in 1888, and he was in the audience, and he saw it played, and he knew how it was supposed to be played, and he knew how it could be played. And we know that, you know, everyone says, well, the romantic, the romantic performances were always, you know, tempo-wise all over the place and very crazy and all that. Some were, and some weren't. Some artists were very free with Tempe. Some were very strict. Montu was one of the stricter guys. But that's not the point. The point is that Roger Norrington gave an interview where they actually asked him, what do you have to say about conductors who lived through this supposed transition from no vibrato to tons of vibrato like we have now, continuous vibrato? Why do they put up with it? And Norrington said, this, this is a good one, folks. Hang on to your hats. He said, well, they had no choice. They just had to put up with it. Well, what kind of foolishness is that? Is he saying that conductors like Monteux, who were actually at the premiere of a work and who recorded it 80 years later, 70 years later, with a modern orchestra, had no choice with how that orchestra played it? And, and that he... The great Roger Norrington is the first to tell orchestras how much vibrato to use or not use? I mean, is he out of his mind? There's all kinds of evidence, anecdotal and otherwise, about conductors telling orchestras how much vibrato to use. Toscanini talks about it in print. Hamilton Hardy said to his orchestra, don't play with vibrato at the beginning of the Symphony Fantastique. Add it later, after the introduction. I mean, they could have said no vibrato, guys, whenever they wanted to. Eric Kleiber, when he did the Eroica Symphony, would ask the orchestra to play the initial bars of the funeral march without vibrato to make, the, the, to make that cold, numb, gray sound that the music has to have. Conductors always talk about vibrato. And Desiree Emil Engelbrecht said, gee, if only these players would use less vibrato going from piano to pianissimo, they could achieve the dynamic gradation more easily. I mean, all of this, I've documented all of it. I mean, it's all out there. Roger Norrington is full of crap when he says that conductors simply had to put up with what was there and had no say over what their musicians did. And particularly, look at the generation of conductors he's saying had no say. People like Carlos Kleiber and Fort Fengler and Reiner and Zell and, and you know, the, the Toscanini. I mean, the crazy dictator, maniacal, you know, Svengali conductors, the ones who had absolute control, not over the orchestra, over just over the orchestra. I mean, Mravinsky, but over life and death. I mean, hell, if you disagree with, with Mravinsky, you wound up in a labor camp, for God's sake. Do you think he couldn't have said, gee, folks, no vibrato in this passage? So we know that Norrington is crazy, and we have an actual historical legacy of authentic performances of romantic music by the people who were physically there to hear them done at the time that they were premiered. And we have that legacy in glorious, fabulous stereo sound. So there was never any reason, any reason to give this man two seconds of your time, never mind a job in front of a prestigious orchestra and a recording contract. So, for the Franck D minor, let's let's go back to our topic now, having made that point, I think, which needed to be made. You've got two approaches in some. You have the 
romantic, impulsive, spontaneous Bernstein. You have the more classically restrained, but every bit as exciting and propulsive and brilliantly balanced Monteux. You really should hear both because the work deserves to be treated as something worthy of, you know, repetition and of a variety of approaches and as the great masterpiece that it is, which is one that sustains a variety of interpretive viewpoints. So keep on listening to the Fronty Minor. Thank you.